So um, hello everyone, a warm welcome to you from the Geneva Learning Foundation. I am Charlotte Mbou, and uh, for today's lightning chat, we are receiving Francine Ganta Restrepo, Technical Officer for Demand and Behavioral Sciences at the Department of Immunization Vaccines and uh, Biologicals at the World Health Organization headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland. The topic for today's lightning chat is putting communities at the center, local solutions for large impact. This is a lightning chat, as we call it, because we know you are busy. It will take just 15 minutes and we only extend if you have more questions. You can decide if this topic is important for you. If it is relevant uh, for your work, then you can learn more. Uh, and we are going to make available resources for that. I'm going to ask Francine um, the first few questions and I'll be looking to you to ask your own questions and share your comments either in the chat or you may also raise your hand if you wish to speak. So if you are French speaking, this session it, it benefits from a simultaneous interpretation. So you can see on my screen how to turn on uh, inter uh, interpretation on your device. So you click on the interpretation icon, uh, select the French language and cut original audio to hear only that which is being said in French. So I'm going to start uh, with the questions. Uh, and once again, warm welcome to you, uh, uh, Francine. My first question for you is, uh, within the immunization uh, uh, context, how will you define a community and why does it matter? What do we mean by putting communities at the center? What are the potential benefits of engaging with communities and putting them at the center? I know that's uh, quite a number of questions for you to start with. Okay, yes, thank you for that, Charlotte. And also thank you to the participants for, for joining us here today. Um, I'm, I'm really glad to see that this has attracted so much interest it's a really important topic. Um, to start with your first question, uh, what do we mean by communities in the context of immunization? We mean the people that we're trying to, uh, to reach with life-saving vaccines, but we also mean the health workers and um, the community health workers um, and nurses and you know all, all the health system um, people who support the delivery of those vaccines are of course also members of the communities there. Um, so what do we mean by putting communities at the center? That was your second question. Uh, well, what we mean is that we should consider the needs of the communities and all those different groups of individuals that I just outlined. Um, we should consider their needs first and foremost in the planning and in the delivery of immunization services. So that means thinking about things like the location of uh, vaccination services, the timing of sessions, um, and even the whole sort of end-to-end -end experience of getting vaccinated and any follow-up needed after vaccination, um, we should really be considering how those meet the needs of the community. So, you know, that means putting services where they're easy for community members to reach. Um, it's not such a long distance for them to travel, but also considered uh, appropriate, um, an appropriate place for vaccination. It means timing the sessions so that they're at a time when people can actually go. So, um, you know, for example, not um, offering sessions that don't conflict with other important community um, events uh, or, uh, you know, that would perhaps make it difficult for caregivers to attend the sessions because it conflicts with working hours, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and really thinking about vaccination as an experience, right? People need to get to the services. Um, they often have to wait while they're there. There's an interaction that takes place between community members, um, such as uh, parents and, and children, um, and then the uh, the health workers and vaccinators as well. So how do we support those to be fruitful and productive so that people come back and get fully immunized? Um, and so that I'm already touching on um, on you know what are the potential benefits of engaging with the communities there. That was your third question. Well, the biggest benefit, of course, is increased uptake of uh, life-saving vaccines. Um, but 
Other benefits include uh, greater trust in immunization programs, um, but even the uh, health system more broadly. Um, and that can result in more resilient systems that are able to withstand disruptive events such as natural disasters or public health emergencies. Um, uh, you know, putting communities at the center and involving them in the planning and the delivery of immunization services um, can also offer some interesting opportunities for integrated services, um, uh, which can lead to optimized efficiency within the health system and reduced waste. Um, uh, and I think here it's also, again, just really important to stress that uh, when we talk about needs of communities, it's also really important that we consider health workers as part of the community and uh, be sure that we're addressing their needs um, to ensure that they're supported and really well equipped to deliver the best quality services there if we want to see all of those potential benefits that, that I just listed. Okay, thank you uh, so much, Francine, and welcome to you. If you're just joining us, uh, this lightning chat, we have uh, as guest uh, Francine Ganta Restrepo from uh, uh, WHO, and uh, we are talking on putting communities at the center, local solutions for large impact. And remember, I am just starting off with the questions, but I'll be expecting you to uh, uh, ask your questions. You can type them in the chat or raise your hand if you want to speak. So Francine, my next question for you is, uh, what are community, uh, what exactly are community-centered services? And what are the key elements that need to be put in place to offer the services? Yes, that's um, that's a great, uh, great question. Um, so community centered services, and I started to list this already, are really um, services that take into account the people that we are trying to reach for vaccination, right? We consider where they are, what their needs are, what's important to them, and really design and deliver our services according to that. Um, I want to, um, I don't, I don't know if I can share my screen actually, Charlotte. Um, let's see, let's try. Here we go. Yes, please go ahead. <laughs> so some of you might be familiar with this already. This is the journey to health and immunization. And one of the key resources that we have in terms of supporting programs to, um, to be more community centered, to be more people centered, um, is the uh, human centered design for tailoring immunization programs uh, tool. Um, and within that, we offer a, a, range, a range of templates and resources that programs can use to support that reorientation of services to meet the community needs. So as I mentioned earlier, if we think of vaccination as a journey, and I hope, I hope you're seeing my screen here. Are you seeing a figure eight? Yes. Okay, so this is a journey to health and immunization. Um, there are several um, sort of uh, stages to this journey, if you will. It's people knowledge and perceptions of immunization. Also their awareness of the service aspects in themselves, such as where to go, what time to go, um, what you need to bring, right? So bringing your immunization card with you, um, all of these things that set someone up for a positive service experience. Um, it also involves the uh, intentions to go and get vaccinated, their intrinsic motivation to, to go, um, and all the, 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 the preparation cost and effort is another important stage there. You know, so um, in many cases, we know that that, for example, um, mothers might have to arrange uh, transportation because it's too far to walk, or they'll have to arrange childcare for other children to ensure um, that they can actually go and get uh, their, their children vaccinated. Um, and then there's the, you know, the actual point of service and that interaction, as, as I spoke about, between um, caregivers, children, and the vaccinators, and everyone that they meet um, within the health system. It's the waiting time at the clinic, whether or not they're treated with respect, 
um, and the experience of care while they're there. And then, as I said, there's also potential follow up after the service, you know, reminders to come back, um, any information about how to deal with adverse events should they come up. Um, and as I said, we really want, uh, when, when, when services are community centered, when they're reoriented to really meet the needs of the people uh, that we're trying to reach with vaccination, but also the people who are there to deliver a positive experience, right? So health workers are well equipped um, to be providing that positive experience. Um, when, this is, when this is successful, then we will see that people will complete this journey many times over um, for full vaccination, right? Because it's not just one vaccine, it's coming back and getting fully immunized. That's, that's the real aim there. So I hope, I hope that's helpful in answering the question, you know, what, 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 what are community-centered services and, and, and how, do we, how do we achieve that? Uh, yes, uh, Francine, uh, thank you very much. Now we have uh, two questions in the chat from uh, uh, Bawani Shankar uh, that says, uh, how do you deal with power systems in communities, especially in diverse uh, heterogeneous uh, communities? That's the first question. Uh, do, should I take all the two? Maybe. Uh, uh, yes, so, we can take both. Okay, and the second one is, while it helps to take communities into confidence and involving them in planning, especially reaching decisions in large groups, has been harder. My experience, it's time consuming and can derail programs. In such cases, the system decides to take its own decisions. Please advise, can you advise on how to deal with such an experience? Yes, so the the first question was on dealing with power groups, and um, I think our second question kind of helps to, to answer that. It's, it's really about involving them, really identifying our key stakeholders, who, who, who are the people we, we need to involve in the planning, in the discussions about what services should look like, um, what's important to the people, uh, and, and really involving them along the way. So in this tool that I've, um, I've been mentioning, the uh, um, human-centered design for tailoring immunization programs tool, we actually, um, we, we actually outline four main steps uh, that you need to do. So as I said, the, the first is making sure you have the right, the right people in the room, make sure you've identified the key stakeholders there, these power groups, and, and, and make sure that you're bringing them into the, the conversations. And then together with them, taking the next steps to diagnose, you know, what, what are potential issues, what are, you know, what, what, what is perhaps less community centered, and we might need to um, we might need to address what are some of the barriers to vaccination, what's working well, what's what's not working uh, so well so that we can leverage what's working well, what's important to uh, communities um, and address uh, any, any barriers that we have along the way. Um, and that leads into the next step, which is design. So again, with those key stakeholders um, as part of the discussion, making sure that we're really not, not doing this just within the health system, but really uh, also involving um, religious leaders where relevant, um, community leaders, um, and, and, and just influential persons within, within the community that are, that are, are well respected by their um, to design solutions for those possible barriers identified and implement them and then evaluate them. So those are the four that we outline and um, as I said in this guidance we have um, and you can probably start to see a hint a hint of that over here uh, lots of templates um, to support uh, programs to support health facilities to be uh, taking those steps together with those key stakeholders and then the second question um, yes was about uh, you know while it's helped helpful um, to involve communities. Sometimes this can be time consuming or even derail programs. Um, and I'm, yeah, that's, that's an unfortunate experience. And, um, you know, this is why we've developed a guide that we've developed and really try to keep it very focused and offer those templates um, so that um, at every step along the way, 
you're really, uh, you're really considering how would this improve the immunization program for the people we're trying to reach and for the people who need to um, support those services as well, right? So that we are not, um, we're not, uh, you know, accommodating for community members uh, while adding more burden to health workers, because again, they are also members of the community. It's also really important um, that when we when we think about services, we really consider how we to deliver quality immunization. So was there another question there, Charlotte? Yes, Francine, and thank you so much. There are, uh, we have quite a number of questions already in the chat, but if you're able to speak, you can also raise your hand to ask your question to Francine directly. So there's a question from Boma Otobo that says, what factors will make a community hesitant about immunization? For example, how can they handle misconceptions about vaccination? Yeah, that's a great, um, you know, that's a really relevant question. We're seeing a lot of that. Um, we're seeing a lot of discourse around that, um, especially around COVID these days. So I'm actually um, currently um, in the regional office for Africa where we're, we're seeing a lot of reports of that. But um, at the same time, when you dig further and further, you realize that yes, while rumors and misinformation are prolific and um, <sighs> The way that we talk about hesitancy, the way that we describe hesitancy, um, sometimes um, makes it seem like more of an obstacle to vaccination than what it really is. So I want to address that, and I want to do that using the best framework. So I, I hope you're still seeing my screen. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, and you know, on the screen, I'm showing what are the main factors that influence uh, vaccine uptake. Uh, so we know that these are four main drivers of vaccine uptake. It's what people think and feel about vaccines. It's the social processes that happen around vaccinations, such as norms, but also such as um, recommendations from your health worker, from your general practitioner. you know, um, potential doubt or hesitancy to get vaccinated. Um, and then of course, all the practical issues along the way, um, which we've talked a bit about already, the um, affordability, accessibility, convenience, and quality of services is, is really important there. And so these four main behavioral and social drivers, each one of these boxes here, the thinking and feeling, social processes, motivation, practical issues are what determine vaccine uptake. They're what, what determine whether or not someone will get vaccinated. Um, and so it's very interesting because we're seeing that um, the way in which these interact, it's not one factor alone that uh, will determine whether or not someone gets vac vaccinated, but it's how these interact. Uh, and so while we're seeing the rumors, while we're seeing hesitancy to get vaccinated, we're still seeing people accept vaccines, right? Where the services are convenient uh, and high quality and, you know, uh, to an affordable and where there is the uh, recommendations from health workers to go and get vaccinated, the um, support of friends and family, of other people in your community, um, people are still going to get vaccinated despite hesitancy or doubt or questions or rumors and misinformation about vaccines. So it's really interesting to see um, how it's not one of these domains that impacts vaccination, but actually how, how they come together um, and, and the interactions between them as well. Okay, thank you very much, Francine. Uh, Abebe Sosa, you raised your hand and you also have a question in the chat. So I'm asking you to, in, to unmute yourself. Are you able to unmute? And uh, okay, please go ahead, start by introducing yourself and ask your question to Francine. Okay, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is uh, Abebe Sosa from Ethiopia, Minister of Health. So yes, the the topic is very interesting, especially whenever we are 
talking about uh, preventive intervention in public health, the community should be at the center because we are usually reaching the community and uh, uh, rather they are not coming to the facility. So, so the community involvement, the community mobilization is very interesting, very, very critical uh, for the success of the program. So my question is, uh, usually uh, we are uh, uh, trying to, to uh, implement some uh, community uh, engagement and empowerment strategies like um, uh, behavioral change, change communication, health education, and uh, other uh, initiatives to improve the uptake and the demand of the community. But despite that, still the, the, the uptake and the, the beliefs for uh, immunization is low. The community is still very hesitant uh, to uptake and, to, and to, to, to use the service uh, despite the availabilities and others. So what do you think and how, how do you think it, and we can uh, address those things, uh, despite effort, still communities are very hesitant in, in uh, uh, using uh, vaccinations, especially uh, in our countries. Uh, one, they usually when they started, they started and the, the first dose is usually good. And then the special subsequent dose is very high dropout and the default there. And the communities are, are uh, really uh, retracting from the, the follow-up. So, so what what approach and what recommendations do you do you highlight in this regard? Uh, thank you. Oh, well, thank you, Abebe. Over to you, Francine. Yes, that's that's a really great question. And if you haven't done so already, so you you mentioned communities are not coming um, for for vaccination, and I, I think it's really important to. Um, get to the root of the problem to really understand why are they not coming? Um, and, and really, I would encourage you to use this framework that I have up on the screen here and think about all the different things that influence uh, vaccine uptake to really get to the heart of the problem. I would go to the, the communities you're trying to reach directly and ask them, why are they not coming? Because in, 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 in my work to date, a lot of the time what I've seen is that when they're not showing up for services that are free, <laughs> you know, um, that, that are available, it's often because the services are actually not convenient enough to meet the needs of that specific community. Or it can be that um, the service delivery models don't match the expectations um, and the needs of those communities. So they're really not in line with what's important to the community, right? Uh, which, which means that they're discouraged from going to services. Perhaps they went once or twice, but they don't tend to go back. So I would really encourage you to go to those communities and, 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 and really um, investigate in depth, you know, get to the heart of, of the why. Why are they not coming um, and work with them to, to, to really reorient the services to ensure, um, to ensure that it's meeting their needs, to ensure that it's meeting their expectations so that they, they are coming. Because most of the time people are, are, are really um, aware of the importance of vaccination. Um, it's, it's just sometimes we have so many competing priorities uh, that it, it, it doesn't result in uptake. And so our job, um, in immunization is to make sure that uh, we make it as easy as possible for people to get vaccinated. They know it's important. So let's make it, let's make it, um, let's make it easy for them to get vaccinated so that, uh, so that it's not a big effort on their part. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Francine. Uh, Caroline Akosile, your hand is raised and you asked a question in the chat. I'm not going to go back to it. I'm just inviting you to unmute yourself. Please go ahead and introduce yourself and ask your question. Okay, good, good, um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Caroline Akosile. I think you can hear me, Charlotte. Yes, can you Claude, hear me? Yes, okay, Claude, good. please go ahead. Thank you. Um, 
I um, am retired. I am a former staff of UNICEF. I worked with UNICEF for about 20 years. I retired last year, but I'm still interested in um, immunization. So that's why I'm on this IA 2030 ag agenda. So my question basically is, um, how do we deal with AEFI information on uh, in communities, especially communities dealing with hesitancy due to a previous experience of a bad AEFI situation? So how do you make them trust in the efficacy of vaccination again? Thank you. That's, that's a really, really good question. Thank you so much for that, Caroline. Um, and I, I would say it's about showing, showing them the evidence that vaccine works. They, they work to protect and save lives in, in a way that really resonates with them. So looking for those local examples, right? Um, and engaging maybe community elders who, who have been around for times where perhaps uptake was lower. And so we did see more diseases in those uh, discussions as well. But it's really about using the evidence that we have on you know, the fact that vaccines are safe, they are effective, um, and presenting that information in a way that resonates with, with the specific people who have concerns um, uh, uh, and are perhaps hesitant um, to get vaccinated again uh, because because they're hearing about these AEFIs, uh, and yeah, that that takes um, you know that takes a, a good level of sort of interpersonal um, uh, communication skill, um, and I think that this is a really important area of training for health workers because more and more they're confronted with people coming in for vaccination services who are asking questions about AEFIs, you know, they have their phone and they're, you know, they're seeing this information on social media, online, on WhatsApp. Um, and uh, I think in many cases, health workers um, are still not adequately equipped to be handling those questions in a way that is sensitive. Um, and again, in a way that helps them build an argument that's really going to resonate, right? It's it's not enough to show them the data. You have to show it in a way that makes them care and makes, um, makes communities, makes parents who are coming in to give their children vaccines or makes adults who are coming in for their own COVID-19 vaccination or flu vaccination, which, whichever one it is, um, really trust that you have their best interest in mind and you, you, you're, you're presenting the, the evidence in a way that they, they can understand it and, and really builds a relationship with the, with the service and the health system. Okay, thank you so much, Francine. We are almost out of time, but I really want us to answer one last question from uh, one of the Francophone participants. It comes from uh, Ijabu uh, Bakari from uh, uh, Comoros. He asks, uh, uh, I'll just read the question in the French uh, language and then uh, su summarize in English. Uh, en Union des Comores, nous avons vacciné 60% des adultes et comptons vacciner bientôt 23% des 12 à 17 ans. L'approche retenue est communautaire et vise d'abord les parents, leur consentement. Par quel biais peut-on les convaincre plus facilement? Merci. So uh, they are planning, they started COVID-19 vaccination with the adults and they are able to vaccinate oh, 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 about 60% and they want to start uh, uh, vaccinating the 12 to 17 year olds, 23% of them, that's their target. And the approach they have adopted is uh, uh, it's a community approach with which they want to, first of all, uh, 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 meet parents and uh, uh, get their consent. So he wants to find out what, uh, what strategies can they use to easily convince parents to consent to their children being vaccinated? Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think that an important group to engage there is not just the parents of the children, um, but also educators uh, to bring them in. So that, again, if we, if we go back to the model um, I shared, and, you know, again, before you take these steps, 
uh, is is really to map out who are the key stakeholders here, who are who are the influential persons I, I need involved, whose perspectives do I need to bring in here? And indeed, it's the parents. Um, in some cases, it might be the adolescents themselves, um, uh, school teachers, um, any kind of adolescent or youth group, um, groups that you might want to involve there as well. Uh, and really, I, I would say just to create a space for that dialogue, that discussion that really helps to understand what are the concerns, you know, and that's the diagnosis. What are what are the concerns? You know, if, if we're going to if we're going to do this, what, what kinds of concerns do we need to address first? How, how would we need um, to set up our uh, vaccination services, uh, whether it's fixed sites or outreach? Um, how, how do we set those up so that it's so that it's easy to reach the people we want to reach so that it's convenient for them? Uh, to, to come and get vaccinated and working with all those stakeholders that you've identified to, to design and plan those services and working with them in the delivery of that as well. Um, so that that's what I, I would recommend there is, you know, um, really think very carefully about how who you need to involve in, in those discussions and then take this stepwise approach. Um, that, that I have on the page here and keeping keeping everyone engaged along the way in those conversations, in the planning and the design. Um, and then also, you know, following vaccination um, activities, it's really important to communicate back to the community, you know, what, what, what was the outcome of those discussions? Uh, how, how, how did the vaccination session goes go? And just um, really um, making sure that it's not we vaccinated now we're done um, with COVID nineteen vaccines. It's really important to keep communities engaged even after the process, so that people people see examples where where you know others are getting vaccinated. And we really establish social norms around this as well. Um, so communicating the successes there is 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 always a good idea. Thank you. Thank you much, uh, Francine, for sharing uh, uh, this with us. Uh, one last thing I'd like to uh, ask of you is uh, that could help those participants. And considering the number of questions and comments that we have in the chat that we are unable to, to get responses to, can we have uh, access to the PowerPoint so that we can share with other uh, participants? Absolutely. So there are two key resources. So the one I've been mostly talking around is the um, human centered design for tailoring immunization programs tool. So we're set to publish this, but I can I can share I can share a copy with you for the participants. Absolutely. And then the other one is the behavioral and social drivers of a vaccination tool. Um, what we what we sort of call BEZD as a shorthand. And this contains surveys and qualitative uh, interview discussion guides to support that diagnosis stage. So I see some, some questions are really uh, centering around the diagnosis and others are more around the design and implementation. Those are the two key resources I would recommend. And to say that um, the human-centered design for tailoring immunizations program tool uh, really uh, leverages the BEZ tool. So it, it really leans on this framework and uses that evidence for what we know determines uh, uptake of vaccines. So those are very complementary. Thank you very much, Francine, and thank you everyone for your active participation, for the questions, the comments in the chat, in today's uh, lightning chat. So, um, uh, sorry for that. I'll just uh, uh, sh share my screen again if possible. But if not, the lightning chat. So that is PM Janet Catherine Kane from the World Health Organization on the topic human resources for health, current challenges, and future options. So I hope uh, you don't miss it. And uh, if you um, if you missed any of our previous lightning chats, I'm inviting you to to click on the links that I just shared in the chat for the recordings of our previous uh, lightning chat. Uh, once again, uh, thank you, Francine, for joining us uh, today and for answering our questions. 
I want to wish everyone a very nice day, um, uh, evening, depending on where you're joining from, and uh, see you uh, in, uh, later on in the day for our last uh, 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 lightning chat in this series. Until then, uh, bye for now. Thank you very much and, and bye bye. Thanks, Francine. Bye.